Hello, I'm Tim Holy, and I'm going to demonstrate some new tools that Julia developers now have to help them solve performance problems. I'm going to share my screen and do a very simple demo. It's a pretty artificial demo, but hopefully that will make it easier to understand. I'm going to first start by launching Julia. I'm going to create a function, and I've run this before, so I just had to hit the up arrow to go back in my history. It's, it's this function, I'm calling it profile test sort. It's testing a sorting operation. It takes two arguments. It, um, it, all, all this function is supposed to do really is just waste some time. There's no real purpose to it. Um, and uh, essentially it's a list of how many jobs you're going to do and how big each job is, is controlled by this len parameter. What the job is, is basically is to create an empty list and then grow the list incrementally by appending a random number to the list each time. And once you've grown the list of size len, then you sort it in place, okay? And that's all it is. And then it just does that n times. So I'm gonna define that function. Usually when you um, uh, create a new Julia function, the, you, before you do any timing or benchmarking, you should at least run it at least once to make sure it works and also to, um, force compilation of it because you don't want to count compilation time um, in, in there. And so then I'm going to try timing this and let's time a little bit bigger job. And what you can see here is it takes about three quarters of a second. But more concerningly, I want to call your attention to the fact that it says there's a million allocations and of you know uh, 41, 41 uh, megabytes. Um, this is a bit surprising that it's this many allocations. There are allocations in this code. It's creating an empty list and then it's growing it. As it grows, it grows it by factors of two. And so there will be several allocations to do that, but a million is way more than you would expect from that. This should be your first indication of trouble. How might we go about diagnosing that? Well, I'm gonna illustrate a package called Profile View. It's a graphical viewer of Julia's fundamental profiling capabilities. Profile view exports a macro called uh, prof view. VS Code does too. If you want to use the one in profile view, you have to put uh, profile view out in front of it. If you're using doing this in a VS Code environment, um, it's not necessary in a REPL like this. And let's just run the exact same job, 10, 10 iterations. And so now we have collected some profiling data and here is a window that pops up. Now, if you're unfamiliar with flame graphs, very briefly, time is on the horizontal axis. The wider a bar is, the more time it takes. Call depth is on the vertical axis. So this line of this uh, function calls this function here and it's, it's currently spending time on that line 660, 660 which calls this function and it's, most of the time is being spent on line 715 and so on. You know, and the callees, all of the cumulative time of all the callees adds up so that the caller time is at least that wide, but the caller is not adding very much extra time. You can see that these bars are only barely getting thinner. So the real time in your code is being taken by what's sitting at the top here of this flame graph. Um, and what we can see from this is that sor the sorting operation is the thing that takes most of the time because it accounts for most of the width of this window. Um, Profile view also helpfully colors some of these bars in red. And this is a warning sign to you that there's something wrong or at least not very I optimal about these lines. And what this is an indication of a phenomenon known of as sometimes type instability or poor inferability or runtime dispatch. And uh, this is something that can really slow the uh, performance of Julia code. It can also account for a large number of allocations. So your first goal in trying to fix the performance of this code should be to try to get rid of the red. So the new tools allow you to diagnose why this red happens maybe more easily. So what you can do is you can click on one of these bars. It prints some detail about the specific call that's being made here, which function it is in this partition function, it's on line 1003 for that particular bar we clicked on. And you can see the types of the arguments that are passed to it, okay? Now, profile view, the new functionality, it's in profile view, which is a fairly small change, a much bigger change is what it does. It allows you to integrate with a second package called Cthulhu more readily. So in order to uh, access this, 
I'm going to say, uh, I, I'm going to execute this function to send click. Now, I know this is going to cause an error, but I think many of us will do this many times. I want to emphasize the little warning sign that it says. For this to run, it tells you you have to be loading the Cthulhu package. So I'm going to copy and paste that line. And I'm going to load the Cthulhu package. And now I'm just going to try again. Now let's wait a second here. And what you can see is after it looks up some code, what you can see here is a printout of the source code of the partition function. And you can see the line number here on the left. There's that line 1003 that we clicked on. 1010 was pretty prominent in some of them too. And one of the things, if, so if you went and you looked in this particular file, you know, this is here on my hard drive, um, I could go look at this file and verify that, in fact, this is exactly what's in the file, with one exception. These colored entries are not present in the file. They're annotations being added by Cthulhu. And the red here evokes the red that's in the bars on the profile view. These are places where Julia's type inference failed to come to a concrete conclusion. And so here you can see that the values that are returned by several operations are annotated with these red anys. Okay. So why are they any? Well, to get some additional insight on that, let's look at some of the options that Cthulhu has. So you can see below that where below it where it finishes printing the uh, source code. Now you've got uh, essentially an interactive menu, and you can see there are several toggles. The ones that are in cyan color are currently active, so we're warning. That's what counts for the red coloration here. And the key one I wanted to show you here is this hide type stable statement. So what this is doing is this is suppressing the type printing of anything that is not problematic, it, where it has a concrete type. I'm going to toggle that so that we're no longer hiding the type stable statements. And now you can see we're seeing everything. The anys are still in red because warn is still on, but, the, but we're no longer hiding the type stable statements. We're seeing everything. What you can see here, for example, is that V is a vector of any, right? And any, mean what it means is that it could have any element type at all. So when you extract an, an element from it just by indexing, then you get an object of type any. And this is the source of the performance problem. Julia can't figure out what it is. And so some of these subsequent calls, like um, you know the, these um, uh, less than operations and all, it doesn't know what it's going to be, and therefore it, um, it, it, it runs into problems. Finally, below that, you can the reason it's called the send is because you can actually dive in deeper. You can uh, go and you can see some of the source code you know, that underlies some of these other things here. Some of these are marked runtime, which means these are called by runtime dispatch. And that's really why. Um, uh, the, those bars were red in profile view, right? And that's because this X here um, is not uh, is not a clearly understood understood type, basically, right? So um, so you can see lots and lots of problems with the, with this code here. Here, if I click on this, you can dive in a little bit deeper, and now you're seeing uh, the code that is being used to add FX to offset here, right? Um, and um, in this particular case, you can see that it's uh, uh, you know that that it's being called here with with uh, with two with a bool and and an int here in this particular case. So I'm going to go back, uh, go down here and select back. I'm back in my partition function here, and I might want to know well why on earth are all of these why is this v a vector of any well. There are two strategies you could use for that. One, you could just simply sort of work your way down and click on all of these things and, and take a look at their code. And that's that's a good good way to solve it. But profile view has that's it's pretty common. Profile view has another um, uh, tool. Instead of calling descend click, we're going to call ascend click. And what that's basically doing is, is it's giving you a way of traversing the entire call sequence that underlies uh, that particular statement. And so what you can see here is here, here we're at the partition function. Um, and uh, what you can see is this is being called by 
with all these different sort methods. And if we scroll downward, we keep going. What you can see is that all of these things are receiving this vector of any, right? And in particular, sort itself is receiving a vector of any. Well, why is that? Well, finally here, we get to the source of the problems, which is the code we wrote. So what I'm going to do, you can see this, this carrot that's pointing to the right there. I'm going to just click on that, and I'm going to go into the Browse Typed Code option. And what you can see here is, if I turn off the Hide Type Stable mode, is that what you can see is that list itself is a vector of any, right? And so we're, we're adding float 64s to the list, but once they go into the list, that list doesn't declare an element type that's any more specific than any. Why is that? Well, here in the source code itself, these square brackets create a vector of any. Um, and you can, you can see that here. A few of these calls don't look like your source code. This is a good example here. This is one where intern what's going on internally in Julia is that these square brackets are calling a function called vect. This doesn't quite match any name up here in the code, and so it's unmatched, and so you get these sort of little percent numbers out in front here. But you can see that, that this occurs here between lines two and lines four, so that must be probably be on line three, and therefore it's that call here. And uh, you can see that it's been annotated as a vector of any. So the way we would fix this then, we might suggest, is we might change our function definition so that instead of being a list of any, let's create it as a list of float 64. Now we run it once, and now we time it. And now you can see the number of allocations is much lower. Also, the total runtime, rather than being three quarters of a second, was was you know less than a fifth of a second. So we've and if we now um, profile it. Now you can see we've gotten rid of the red. We still have performance problems. It's not, this turns out to be a bad way to fill a list with random numbers, for example. There are lots of things we could do to make this even better, but um, this hopefully illustrates the, 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 the new capabilities. So what's really new in all of this um, is that uh, Cthulhu has historically represented uh, its information in a harder to understand mode and um, which is a direct view of Julia's type inferred code. And the new capability really is the ability to try to map that those results of type inference back to the source code that you wrote. I want to caution users that it's a that's a hard problem to solve. And the way that Cthulhu is doing it is imperfect. There will be mistakes made. Please file bug reports so that we can make it as good as it can be. It may never be perfect. It, 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 uh, at least not until Julie itself keeps track during inference of where each statement came from relative to your source code. I think if that happens, then we can really solve this problem perfectly. But for now, my hope is that this new tool will be useful to quite a, uh, a number of people. Thank you for your attention.